Welcome to another episode of the Tour On Air podcast. And today I'm joined by Peter Ward, who is a professor at the University of Washington, a paleontologist. Uh, I probably totally butchered, you know, the, uh, uh, the way to say this. And an astrobiologist who studies life on Earth, where it came from, how it ends. And I think this is a big focus of your work uh, and what that means to us. Uh, very excited to speak to you today. Um, hopefully won't leave this uh, conversation too depressed uh, about what lies ahead of us. Um, welcome, Peter. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm just so excited to hear from you guys. So it's an honor for me. Thank you. So, Peter, you dedicated your career to, you know, a big part of your career, at least, to studying mass extinction. Um, and I wonder, like, why? And also, how does that make you feel? Um, I'm reminded of a scene um, in the movie Annie Hall, um, where, you know, this young kid goes to see the doctor uh, and, you know, the doctor says, how are you? And the kid says, I'm, you know, super depressed. And the doctor says, why? And then the kid kind of explains uh, that he's depressed because the universe is, ex is expanding and it will ultimately break uh, apart. And then the doctor says, well, but that's only going to happen in a few billion years. Um, so um, I guess it can be impactful, though, um, you know, to deal with this on a day to day basis. So I just wonder, you know, how did you get into it? And, you know, how does it make you feel to think about mass extinction? Well, part of it is because all of this is children sooner or later and to too many of us. And think about Ukraine right now. We experience death close by family members, grandparents, parents, siblings. No one escapes unscathed, I think, even as children. There's somebody close to us who dies. And somewhere, uh, the loss of innocence with Santa Claus, for instance, is trivial. But the loss of innocence, when you realize that life is, is very finite, it's not only finite, but that people around you will disappear and that it can de destroy and devastate you that it's so powerful. The death becomes a concept that's obviously fascinating. Horror movies are everywhere because we like the chill and the thrill, but it really goes back to the sense of mortality that maybe you and I will be the only people who are immortal, but I kind of don't want to bet on that for either of us. But it's, it's that power. And then when you look at the fossil record, The power of one person dying or several people around you and then realize entire worlds disappear, the whole faunas, dinosaurs. When I recognized dinosaurs died out quickly in an agony and discovered this, it, it was to me just so sad. But then really what kept me going was that the mass extinctions are again this writ, death writ large. And yet there are survivors. And from the survivors come the seeds of the next, next great generation, the next, the mammals, for instance. Or today in my class, I teach a history of life class. We're talking about the Cambrian explosion. All these animal phyla appeared 540 to 530 million years ago out of the seeds of death of the first group of animals called Ediacarans. They die out. The opportunities that arise from death are really life-giving. And so, yes, it's death, but it's also life. And that, that duality fascinated me and still does. And also in your TED Talk, um, you know, you talk about kind of, you know, science fiction. Um, and before we get, you know, deeper into, you know, some of the theses and, uh, you know, concrete things and books that, uh, you know, you've worked on, um, I kind of want to just, you know, have one more warm up question uh, on kind of science fiction uh, in general and, you know, sticking to, you know, this topic of movies. Um, which movie do you think gets the future of the earth and mankind kind of most in line with how you and other scientists predict the path forward? Boy, there are so many, but there are so many that get it so wrong in, in so many ways. Um, One of the, so there are so many movies that have affected me, but I thought 2001, A Space Odyssey was so powerful. How is it that the special effects of that movie, you go back and look at it now, and they were supposedly so primitive to what we have now. There has still never been 
a better space opera. And also the stakes, the fact that it isn't just about going out to Jupiter or finding stuff on the moon. It's Arthur C. Clarke was really struck and dealing with the transcendence. His greatest, greatest book of all was called Childhood's End in which an aliens come and they are so advanced beyond us, they have starships, but there's something about humans that can transcend beyond where we are now. Clark was fascinated by that. 2001 A Space Odyssey is a manifestation of that. And really it's the last movie, if I could be trivial, where spaceships didn't make noise in space. That still drives me crazy. I mean, come to spaceship, there's no noise in space. So I <laughs> love that movie. Another movie that really scared me a lot because I think it's very carefully done is the movie Gattaca. And this is where, this is the movie where we are genetic engineering and there's the haves and have nots, which is a metaphor for those of us with money or not money. But what if instead of money is genes? And there's a reality to that. I mean, with CRISPR, with our ability to manipulate genes now, CRISPR can become available to the wealthy that we can have an entire class of people who are genetically engineering new kids. And how do you want your kid? Tall, strong, beautiful, athletic, very smart, long lived, not susceptible to diseases. The, that's the ultimate have and have not. And if it becomes as expensive as I think, then this class of billionaires that we have really are engineering. I think this, this to me, one of my books, Future Evolution, was my scenario of how we produce a new human species, that we can genetically engineer humans to 150 years old, that they can reproduce for 100 of that, that they start having children, 50, 60, 80 children, all of whom can have 100 years of money in the bank. So they become so infinitely wealthy that it becomes money, which separates. So, the, so much of science fiction drove my growing up days. I was, I read everything that I could find. And so much of it now I'm, I'm fighting against. Just this morning, a, a study came out that made me so happy and so sad. It's all about how many intelligent species might we estimate there to be in the cosmos. I would bet, I have two sons, I would bet their lives that we are not the only intelligence. How could we be with the numbers so great? There have to be multiple civilizations out there. But the question becomes, and it used to be for SETI, when I wrote the book Rare Earth with Don Brownlee in 2000, my leading enemy on earth became Jill Charter, who runs the SETI Institute in California. She hated that. She hated the book. She hated the idea that there might be far fewer intelligent civilizations than we think. And we put out, I think, pretty cogent ideas. We have just signed a contract for a new rare earth 20, 25 years later, we're writing a sequel to it. We're asking, what didn't we know back then? What do we know now? What's different? And do we really think that we were under, over, or got it just right, the number of intelligent civilizations? The study I referred to just came out from Berkeley. The whole study of how many intelligences there are really devolves to a couple of very simple numbers. The most common stars in our Milky Way and everywhere else are dwarves, M-class dwarves, these tiny little stars. We find exoplanets around these. An exoplanet to be a useful analog for Earth-like planet has to have water on it. Now these are tiny stars and therefore the exoplanets have to be very close to them to be warm enough to keep liquid water. I think we all agree that for Earth life, Earth-like life, animal-like life, analogs, um, a number of very intelligent people said it has to be oxygen-driven life. You can't get nerve cells without oxygen. You can't have movement. David Catling, University of Washington said, look, there can't be silicon aliens. It's gonna be carbon life with oxygen to have any animal-like conception to it. Well, just today it came out that Don Browning and I argued for years that planets which are close to M-class dwarves are called tidally locked, it's like our moon. The same face of that planet is always facing the sun. Just like our moon, we've never seen the backside of the moon, we never will. It is tidally locked. 
it spins around at the same rate that it goes around our Earth, same face. So imagine the Earth now is so close to the sun that one side of the Earth is always in sunshine and one side is always in darkness. Can you have a habitable planet? And SETI has long argued, well, of course. I mean, you could have the Terminator between the two. There would be a thin ridge of near the light, near the dark is just right. Goldilocks would love it there. You could just put Goldilocks in there, just right. And the study came out today said, hell no. Those small M-class dwarfs, which are 85 to 90% of the stars in our Milky Way galaxy, they burp, they burp energy. And we have a solar flare, it becomes a beautiful aurora borealis. When they burp a solar flare, it knocks out a portion of their atmosphere. The study today suggests that none of these planets have an atmosphere left. They've all been blown off by their nearby star. You can't have life like we want it without an atmosphere. As of today, 85% of the stars in the Milky Way can no longer be considered habitable planets for complex organisms. That's killer. But th wouldn't that still leave a lot of, you know, planets and stars where that may be possible? Um, oh, yes. I mean, the, the subline of your book, uh, and it's a best-selling book um, called Rare Earth, Why Complex Life is Uncommon in the Universe. I mean, if you are going to rewrite, you know, or write an update of this book, um, I mean, your, your thesis seems to stay consistent, um, but it's also not like, you know, totally black and white, is it? Um, I mean, what is your take on, you know, kind of outer space, um, alien intelligence? Well, just, again, you've just hit it, that even if we knock out 85% of the stars in the Milky Way, I mean, there are thought to be 350 billion stars, 85% times 350, you still have a whole lot of planetary systems. But of those that are left, many of those aren't any good either. I mean, two big stars, big blue stars, red giants, you're really knocking it down. The, the, as I said earlier, the, the numbers are so vast. Of course, there's other civilizations. But the bad bottom line for us is the reality probably is there is nothing close enough for us to ever have an ability to communicate back and forth. And Don and I have thought a lot about, and again, this is the limitations of older scientists. You know, I think again, going back to Clark, he said older scientists will start making these pronouncements, they start believing themselves. I personally don't believe we'll ever have faster than life like. Starships will never have the, the ability to get to other, other stars with high speed. Generation ships, maybe, but nevertheless, we're talking distances that are so vast that now, let's just say that the nearest civilization is 50 light years away. One way communication by light is 50 years. You don't have many conversations where one side takes 50 years, the other side 50 years back. And especially you get the signal back and said, um, transmission garbled, please repeat. You know, I mean, there we are in, in a terrible situation. Unless we, do, unless we do get thousands of years old, um, I mean, how yeah, likely we do you do. see that, that, you know, that, that's kind of the lifespan we'll be looking at. If we can line. do that. But again, one, one of the very interesting communications I had with Seth Shostak, who is really the brilliant, um, he and I call ourselves our evil twins back and forth. I'm his evil twin Skippy and he's mine. But we debated many times. We like each other a lot. He's brilliant. He's really good. He's one of the best speakers. He has a great radio show. Well, Seth has in lectures, and he did this at the University of Washington, admitted that if we ever do find another alien civilization, he fully expects them to be not the squishy soft life, but the robots that the soft life produces. That we, this biological life, are the step that does produce the ultimate intelligences, which are robotic, are no longer tied to a finite lifespan, that they become, they have transcended. And maybe that's what Clark was talking about, this transcendence, but I don't think Clark was talking about moving robots. So this idea that 
that soft life, squishy life, bloody life, then gives rise to a silicone life form of some sort, AIs, is certainly one of the possibilities. And yet, and yet, that all the years of looking, SETI has found nothing. I mean, it's clear the test has already been made. There's nothing close by that is sending out at least the primitive radio signals we look for. So in theory, though, the probability that I think Elon Musk put a kind of one to one billion that we are living in a simulation is hard to disprove. Well, it is hard to disprove. The matrix is everywhere. There's always green things coming down. Uh, I personally would rather think that my dog is a great reality. And again, I have a 15-year-old dog, and he's so ancient now, and he's about to be, we're going to have to put him down out of mercy. And, and again, this is just the heartbreak of life and death. You know, maybe if you're a robot dog, you could outlive me. I, I don't know if I would like that more or less, but it, it is the fact we are finite certainly adds joy and sadness to us. But even, you know, the, you know, you were talking about CRISPR and, you know, how I guess we also need kind of ethical, you know, standards or at least considerations around, you know, how far we want to innovate in that space. Um, you would still argue that kind of mass extinction um, for humanity on Earth is inevitable? I, all species go extinct. And I wrote a book, my most, well, it was considered my most cynical book called The Medea Hypothesis. And after looking at mass extinctions, we began to, we saw the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. And believe me, after 1980, when the Alvarez's, the brilliant work that they, they did that showed this quite conclusively, we paleontologists from 1980 on started looking everywhere at the other big five mass extinctions, the other big four besides the KT, looking for evidence of impact. This made such sense that big rocks from space come down. In a way, it was comforting. It was, oh, I mean, sheer dumb chance. It was just bad luck. You got smacked by an asteroid. Darn. Except it's not the case. I mean, mass extinctions on planet Earth, only one of them is caused by a large scale asteroid. The rest were caused by life itself. The I'm rest were poisoning by microbial life. Um, certainly the, the heating that led to the amount of global warming that led to the oceans going anoxic was caused by flood basalts, but it's the flood basalts allowing the lack of circulation, too much CO2 in the atmosphere, when the poles heat up to the point that you don't have any temperature gradient between the North and South Pole and the equator, you lose all wind, you lose all ocean currents, you lose everything. When we've had these past flood basalts, great amounts of lava, which it isn't the lava that kills you, it's the CO2 in the lava, the volcanic gases, They heated the planet at the end of the Permian. They did so at the end of the Devonian, at the end of the Triassic, in the middle Jurassic, in the end of the Paleocene. We had these short moments of really, really high CO2 and circulation stopped. Really nasty bacteria that emit hydrogen sulfide begin to take over the oceans. And when they do, they emit hydrogen sulfide. Um, Oxygen levels plummet, certainly in the oceans, to near zero. Mass extinction happens. So that was the mass extinction itself was caused by life. And so the Medea hypothesis was my contrarian view to Gaia. This old James Lovelock Gaia hypothesis that Mother Gaia will fix us and take care of us. And she's this great goddess in the sky who makes the planet better and better and better. Sorry, Medea was the nasty, nasty worst mother in Greek mythology. She was Jason's wife, got kidnapped by Jason, had two kids by him. He was such a shit of a husband that she murdered the kids. Gaia is the great Greek mother. Medea is the opposite. The dirty witch, absolute bad side of it, of life. The life can poison itself. But the hopeful part of that book was the only out. I, I posited that any planet gets life Sooner or later, it's life that kills itself off, unless you get intelligence. Only the advent of intelligence will let you escape this trap of what life does to itself. 
So we have the ability to escape this trap. We have the ability, we can see, we can engineer our way out of the problems that will end life on Earth. It doesn't look like it now, the way our politics works, but I have ultimate faith that yes, we can do this. And what do you think in terms of intelligence? I mean, what can we do to get to that point? Like, do we need to have what I guess, you know, the hippies, uh, you know, would, uh, would call kind of a different level of consciousness? I think we've seen it. I mean, what, what really struck me was going back to murder rate, the, the amount of violence in societies in various times. And if you go back to 1500, 1600 England, the murder rates back then were enormously higher than now. And when you think about the weapons were so much less lethal. I mean, right now, a gun is one of the most lethal and effective ways of killing a human because you bleed out so quickly. A bullet goes through, rips somewhere, hits a blood vessel, an artery, you bleed out. Back in those days, you had to have swords and knives and shares and stones and all the nasty things. You really had to beat on people and stab them and really do ultra violence. And yet, even with less lethal weapons, the murder rates were staggeringly high. We don't see that now. As much as we see the violence that we see in all the societies, I think over long term, human violence is decreasing. Now, I may change my tune. If Putin goes ahead and explodes a dirty weapon in Ukraine, and that we start having nuclear war again, maybe I will become more cynical, but I have a hope that we are progressing. And why do you think, how are we progressing? Is it sort of, you know, that we have just kind of um, up these kind of the standards of our, you know, moral and ethical uh, thinking, or is it that we have progressed also economically as a society in a way that we have more to lose now um, and we're becoming more protective of the environment that we have created for ourselves um, because we're kind of you know seeing like economic and you know progress in, in health etc like what do you think like what what drives this progress and, and how can we get more of it how can we accelerate it well it's just a very simple and, and it's just off the top of my head i think it's because human lifespan has increased that I've noticed I'm getting pretty old as a human for much of history, but in my generation now, not so old. As you do get older, I think life becomes much more precious. I think you, we have so many longer lived people now that perhaps a little wisdom, wisdom seeks, seeps in, that there are this sense how precious life is that we want to extend it for ourselves. And perhaps we see the wisdom of perhaps not hitting our neighbor on the head over some perceived slight in the bar. Um, I don't know, I just got this sense that we are progressing. So a sense of optimism, which really is strange for me because my sister, I used to go on the radio a lot in Seattle and talk about the extinctions and her friends would say, oh, here comes Dr. Doom again. Here comes that guy with the mass extinctions, death and gloom. But I see hope in it all really. But you did at one point um, write about kind of the the Earth eventual fate um, by compressing its kind of 12, 12 billion year old history to a clock uh, spanning yes. 12 hours um, with the first life appearing at 1 a.m., the first animals and plants appearing at 4 a.m., and the present day being 4.29 that's a few years ago. I don't know if we, we are a few seconds more in now, 429, 59 a.m. Um, and sort of predicting that it will all come to an end by 5 a.m., which seems very soon, um, at least, you know, in the kind of metaphor of, of, a, of a clock. Um, you know, how, how urgent do we need to evolve our intelligence and find solution to the most pressing problems and what role does space play in this um you know as elon musk you know things you know that the answers to this lie in space well i, I could see both sides i think what we should do is you never want to have all your eggs in one basket and to me the most powerful argument for spaceflight and colonization beyond the earth is to 
be able to reseed. Sooner or later, we are going to be hit by a rock from space. I mean, this is inevitable. If it's a small rock, we'll be okay. But if it's a KT sized rock, civilization is not going to be able to survive even a two or three kilometer asteroid. It's just, it will wipe out agriculture, mass starvation. It will be the end of civilization as we know it. So that was what was so hopeful and powerful about the recent asteroid busting event that NASA did. I mean, we've done, known for years that we're gonna to need to have asteroid defense. I mean, th this is quite clear. On the other hand, it would be much cheaper to colonize the Marianas Trench, the deepest part of the oceans, than colonize Mars. There, it, it, to put humans on Mars as a second colony, I think to me is at this point in our history, crazy. I think we need probably a millennium of figuring out how to deal with the terrible, terrible effects we have done set in motion. And what we've set in motion is the removal of the ice caps and ice sheets. We have so much pent up CO2 in the atmosphere and the ocean, that if we were to stop all internal combustion engines right now, as you know, there's still gonna be the effects of what civilization is doing. And look what's happening with this war in Ukraine. All of a sudden now, all, these, all this recognition that we had to have some sort of treaty to quit putting CO2 in the atmosphere is put aside. Our president Biden saying, oh no, no, let's release the petroleum reserve. I personally, love the idea of $10 gasoline. I think it's absolutely necessary that we wean off gasoline. It is the nature of the melting ice sheets that is the single greatest threat to human civilization, not to the human species. We'll survive it, but civilization. I mean, the problem is you can live and you can live in misery. And which one would you rather have? My scariest scenario is seeing that the ice sheets, Greenland and the great ice sheets in Antarctica melt to the point that we flood the low latitude and certainly the low elevation rice fields. If we have sea level rise even four to five feet, say two or three meters, the amount of food that no longer gets to humans is staggering. There will be a billion people starving to death minimum. That sort of mass death leads to breakdown in a way that I think none of us can conceive. To me, it's the loss of food that rising sea level poses the greatest threat to human civilization at the present time. Well, the single greatest threat, of course, is nuclear war. And we, we have that back. I mean, I grew up, I was a young boy in the 60s and I hear jets going overhead. And we were the generation that had hide under our, our seats as if that would save you from a nuclear holocaust. And that the generations being born today are being born into another world without again this faciness, that certainly is depressing. But it's sea level change. It's all of the CO2 rising. If you look at the history of life, CO2 is the deadliest, deadliest molecule of all. So if if that is the biggest threat, like what do you currently see as you know the biggest hope? Um, I mean, carbon captures, is that something that if innovated fast enough on and, and scale fast enough on uh, could could be kind of an instrument to, to uh, I was very that. I was very encouraged by the recent Democrat led uh, energy law that just was signed into and the amount of money being put out and one of the interesting things I said or I read was an article asking, with this much money that the Biden administration has then unleashed into the American public, what percent of the next generations will be working in industries that are trying to carbon capture and in industries where we have renewable energy? That instead of the oil fields as the major sense of employment for many of the states in the US of A, maybe it's going to be the generations next to, to reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere, that there are jobs to be had there. But then Onto that hopeful scenario, of course, we now have the current world situation. And we're going to see, the, I think one of the scariest moments of the last several decades will be this winter in Europe, as you know. If Germany is subjected to a cutoff of natural gas, if Europe all of a sudden is just cut off from all Russian petrochemicals, 
what happens? You know, at what point do societies just really throw up their hands? We are in the scary moment. I still optimistic hope that sanity reasserts itself because we really have to figure out how to have many forms of energy. Uh, I was blackballed from a couple of programs when even five years ago, I said, look, we have technology now, next generation nuclear power plants, because it's gonna be safer to have those than it is keep releasing coal fired plants in the atmosphere. All the coal fired plants, there were several per week being produced in China several years ago. This is a dagger to the heart of, of our civilization. I hate the fact, I live in a state where we have Hanford wastes and we are spent billions and billions and billions of dollars trying to deal with the 1940s nuclear wastes. I think we can, technology can deal with it finally, but I think we have to have multiple sources of energy to survive. Look, there's just too many humans is the other problem. I and mean, we're up to 7 billion or seven something billion. And at that point where you have a, a good standard of living for everybody, you're gonna need every possible source of energy, including hydrocarbons. But if we can reduce the amount going into the atmosphere every year, there is gonna be more hope. And what type of intelligence, just you know, to get back to that, you know, kind of, you know, I think very powerful kind of statement, you know, that it requires kind of just evolution and in intelligence, you know, like that that type of, you know, evolution and in intelligence, you know, this pro progress in, in intelligence, you know, I, do you have any ideas uh, or thoughts on on how we can achieve that? Is, is you know, this kind of um, intermingling with um, artificial intelligence, you know, this kind of enhancing our own intelligence uh, with AI, is, is, is that a, a path we need to explore further um, and accelerate? Is the, you know, experimentation with, uh, you know, hallucinetics, um, you know, a way of, of raising consciousness in, in, in that way? Like, what do you think? Yeah, well, let me give you a little parable story, if I will. Um, uh, my stepson is just got his degree in engineering. So he went through four years, he graduated. He's now working for the local uh, electricity companies here. He's helping people in rural areas to reduce their electricity bills through many, many different methods. But he's, oh, I don't even want to say, but many, many times smarter than me. So we've played chess. I've never beaten him. I'm Not only do I not beat him, I am, Within 10 or 15 moves, I've already lost. He's that much smarter than I am. So we both noticed this recent story where, where Magnus resigned in the chess tournament to the American because the American was cheating. Allegedly cheating. Oh, no, come on. We know. Well, okay, I don't want to get sued. Allegedly cheating. Excuse me. Your lawyers can't, didn't hear that. Let's take that. We'll erase that right out. So I asked my son, how is this happening? How did they catch him? And he said, well, we've gotten to the point now where the AIs who can study chess are so much better that what is happening is that uh, it, human chess players are now learning from the AIs how to play yeah. chess. And so it was a case we taught the AIs, we built the AIs, we taught them the rules of chess. They have so advanced beyond us that they're teaching us now new ways to play the game. That's the allegory that I see that should give us hope. We teach the AIs, we have a real problem with CO2. Teach us how to live in this world that we can maximize all our human pleasures and minimize putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Mr. AI, how do you do that? This gives me hope. And for the final section of the interview, let's let's talk about kind of like how you work and how you think and and you know what you read and how you uh, how you live, frankly, you know, with the knowledge that you have. Um, I find that kind of really interesting. You know, like how how does that impact your your own life? Um, you know, like what's a typical day for you, or you know, what have you? learned you know pass on some of this wisdom of uh, what you feel worked for you in, in living a, a fulfilled life um despite this uh, kind of looming threat of mass extinction 
wisdom. I wish I had some. I wish, t- uh, tell me where to go get it. Is there a library where I can check some out? I don't know. I, I'll tell you what has moved me more than almost anything in a very long time. As all of us have, I was so affected by the pandemic. Um, I am still have enough bodily function. I'm a field worker. Basically, I love to go out. I'm a geologist, but a biologist. And my earliest love was for the chambered nautilus, this shellfish, which is a living fossil. They've been around 500 million years. In 1975, as a grad student, I went to New Caledonia and spent three months studying their biology. And I've been going back and trying to work with this animal ever since. After two years of being locked in place, this past year in 2022, I was able to take two trips in April, even amid COVID and all the rules, it was such a difficult trip. I flew to Papua New Guinea and some of the farthest reaches of Papua New Guinea. I had to pass through Port Moresby. And then I went to a place called New Ireland, Caviang, and spent three weeks working and discovered just fabulous things. What was interesting and scary after every the big mass extinctions, creatures very close to the Nautilus took over. They're excellent disaster species. What we have done in the four reef slopes, and this is in front of coral reefs. Coral reefs are beautiful, warm, sunny places. We love to dive in them. If you go offshore, they very rapidly drop into very deep water. So from 100 to 500, 600 meters, it's dark. It's cold, it's a whole different set of animals. And that's where these chambered nautiluses live. What's going on down there? Well, what we've done down there is remove all the food fish over the next 30, 40, or over the last 30, 40 years, this massive fishing all over the world has taken fish out from everywhere, including this deep water areas. The problem with deep water organisms is that they are few in number, they are very long lived. Some fish down there, 100, 200 years old, they produce very few offspring. Fishing in that area wipes things out. What they haven't wiped out, we humans, are the Nautiluses. They're exploding down there. An article came out several weeks ago saying cephalopods are exploding in numbers all over the oceans. They are a disaster species because the mass extinction has already hit the oceans. We have done the mass extinction of the oceans through overfishing. The next species are taking over and they seem to be cephalopods. And my work on these things trapping, there are more Nautiluses down there than ever before. And we found what look like new types. There is a revolution taking place deep down in the dark that we don't see. But what struck me and really broke my heart were the human habitations of Papua New Guinea. Port Moresby lives right on the equator. When you're on the equator, there's no wind. It's called the doldrums. There are no hurricanes. There's no typhoons. Every single day is exactly the same. The sun goes down at 6 p.m. The sun comes up at 6 a.m. It never changes. There are no seasons. It's always the same. It's always hot. It's always sticky. It's always miserable. Humans living at the equator always turn to drugs of one type or another. You go around the world at the equator and you're going to find some drug to keep you going. It, there's, it could be cot, it could be ganja, it could be this and that. In Papua New Guinea and much of Asia, it's betel nut. Betel nut is free. It's all over the trees. It's a drug that doesn't cost anything. And all you need to do is grab that nut, wrap it in a piece of of palm tree, put a piece of lime coral in it and chew. Narcotic comes, whoosh, you can get through an hour. Well, an hour later, you take another one, whoosh. What it does though, it files your teeth down to red stumps. There were nobody, I saw no one with gray hair in Papua New Guinea because people all die by 40 and 50. Tooth decay leads to heart problems. It leads to short lived lives. The life at the equator that I saw, the tribal warfare driving through Papua New Guinea, we went right through a gang war, people shooting back and forth at each other. It's squalid misery. The equator where heat keeps rising is the place I think where humans, the future of humans will be if we do not get control 
of the atmosphere. I saw the future and it was really scary. I mean, those are almost the perfect uh, final words for this podcast, but I, I do have one other question that we ask everybody um, that comes on, on the podcast and it's um, around pivoting. So um, I'm, I'm on this kind of mission to uncover Uh, you know, tips and, and ideas and mental models and frameworks that people have um, when they're faced with, you know, the kind of option of pivoting their, you know, often we talk about businesses or product development, but in your case, maybe, you know, a thesis, a hunch, you know, something that you're exploring, that you're researching, that you're looking into, um, and the decision to kind of keep going um, and kind of incrementally Uh, getting ahead, revising, but continuing on, on that path versus taking a, a step function a type of detour and, uh, and, and you know, pursuing something else. Uh, have you in the past uh, you know, uh, had to deal with that decision and, and how did you approach deciding? Well, for any scientist, the decision is to keep going in the area you're going or, as you say, pivot. Um, I was introduced at some talk I gave some decades ago by some person who said, this is Peter Ward. He's a man who's clearly easily bored. <laughs> that, I think it was the statement about the different scientific interests I have. It's not that I get bored. It's just there's so much that's interesting and I've got a short life and I like to do a lot of different things because it's so exciting. I'm trying to figure out right now with the life and the time I have left what do I want to concentrate on? Um, I wish I had the ability to do more field research. And so part of that is to keep your body and your mind in shape. Part of my reason I wanted to go to Papua New Guinea was simply, am I capable of traveling COVID? It's really hard. It was really hard to get there. All of the, I had to pass through Australia the number of hoops and paperwork and the ability to get through Australia with COVID was really hard. But what broke my heart, I love Australia. I've lived there multiple times on sabbaticals. And what I saw in Australia in Brisbane scared me. Seattle, Washington and Portland, Oregon, we have people living on freeway exits in pup tents everywhere. I had never seen that in Australia. And yet on the streets of Brisbane, people in sleeping bags, That was a scary thought. It wasn't just Port Moresby, but even Australia, where we're finding the, it, the economic dislocation. I wish every country in the world could elect a woman leader. I think women are much more suited for politics than we men. Um, I'm so glad to see that other countries are at least trying to do this, but we need to understand that we have to have more tolerance for each other because there are so many more of us every year. And in politics and everything else, what we're seeing is intolerance, but a lot of it is male driven that I can see. I, I, that's so, so I need, naive and probably, but I really truly believe this. I think we, we need, we men need to step aside a little bit, do what other things we do, but let women take over for a while. And in doing that, we need to raise the standard of living of women everywhere. And I think everybody would be better off. Peter, thanks so much. This is, um, I think, a, a great end uh, to a conversation that, you know, we hopefully will continue. But I think there's lots of uh, areas to um, explore um, in, in your work. Um, hopefully see you maybe at one of our events. Um, and until then, I wish you all the best. Well, I'm here for you if you need me, but it was fun. And thank you so much for the questions, but mostly thank you for doing what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's easy to say, but nevertheless, it is people like you and events like this that can make change. So I'm going to thank you for this. Thanks so much, Peter.